This turns out to be our final lesson in the series, Keeping It Real. I found out on last Lord's Day that we won't be having Bible study this coming Wednesday. So tonight, I'll have to wrap this series up. And so tonight, what we will do is we will summarize uh, this series. <clears throat> Six months ago, we began this series, Keeping It Real. And in the beginning of the series, we started off the series by talking about uh, the fact that as Christians, we are not exempt from things that happen in the world. The Lord said we are in the world, but not of the world. And so being in the world, we are exposed to things that are in the world. We struggle, we face storm, we face pain and heartache, just like everyone else. The difference between us and the world is our response to the trials and to the issues of life. We also spoke about in this series, during the course of this series, we talked about giants and the fact that as Christians, we face giants. And a giant, by definition, is something or someone that's larger than life. And just to give you an example of something larger than life, i.e. a giant, the family of the young man that was killed last night, they're facing a giant right now. My uncle became sick a few months ago, so we were expecting him to pass. But the sudden death of someone tragically and violently, that's a giant that that family is having to face. So we talked about the fact that we do face giants as Christians. Uh, we talked about the fact that we have an enemy. And we looked at some of the different names that he's called by. We talked about his devices, some of the different ways that he comes at us. You know, he's very tricky, very cunning in how he comes at us. Sometimes he comes at us disguised as you know, something good, but ultimately it ends up being something bad. Then we discussed some of the issues that we face in this life. We talked about abuse, we talked about neglect, about the lack of love, about unmet needs, and what these issues do in our lives if we don't handle them properly, if we don't turn to the right source to deal with them, what it can do, you know, impacting our lives. Then we looked at how Jesus is qualified to deal with our issues. He is qualified to deal with our issues, number one, because he experienced them. The Hebrew writer said, you know, that he has experienced what we have experienced. He is qualified because he has been given all power. He has all power. Thirdly, he's qualified because he cares. That makes all the difference in the world. If you've experienced something or you have control or power to do something and yet don't have compassion, don't have the motivation to do something about it, it does us no good. The scriptures teaches us that the Lord cares for us. Isn't that right? That he's a compassionate God. So we know that he's able. And then we spoke last week about how to access the power of Jesus. And we didn't get to finish that handout, and maybe if time permits, we'll have an opportunity to revisit that handout. But I gave you the handout with everything listed on there. So if we do not get an opportunity to discuss it tonight, you have the information. But we asked last week, how do you access the power of Jesus? We said, number one, by being in covenant relationship with him. Being in covenant relationship with him puts you into Christ. It puts you into a relationship with God through Christ. It puts you in under the covering of the blood of Christ. Being in covenant relationship means that our battles are his battles. Our care is his concern. So we don't have to fight all of our battles and we don't have to worry about our needs because we are in covenant relationship with someone who is able 
to do something about that. Isn't that right? Then we said last week, you access, access the power of Jesus through prayer. You want the power of Jesus? Ask for it. The scripture says we have not because we ask not, right? Being preached in kings in the kingdom of God gives us direct access to the throne of God. And the Hebrew writer said that we should come boldly to the throne of grace. Everyone in times past did not have that access to the throne of God. Only certain individuals, but in the New Testament, under the new covenant, we have direct and personal access to the throne of God. And so we must use it when we need it. Then we said that we need to be connected. To access the power of Jesus, you need to be connected to him. He said in John chapter 15, verse one, I am the true vine. You are the branches. My father is the vine dresser. Isn't that right? right. Jesus is the vine, we are branches, and as long as we are connected to the vine, we have access to the power source. And I explained to you last week that that word he used, true vine, means genuine, which implies that there are some power sources that people try to access that are not genuine. You know, for instance, a lot of people believe that their money or their power or their prestige or their education or you know, their location that this is their power source. No, that's a false power source. The source of true power is being connected to Jesus Christ. And as long as we are connected to him, and it also says in that text, John, matter of fact, let's read that. Let's, John chapter 15, I need, I need to show you some things. John 15, verse one beginning. <clears throat> Someone read that for me. I am the true vine. Here you go. My father is read through the God. mic, bro. Read it in here. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are you, you are so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Mm -hmm. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Mm -hmm. I am the vine, you are the branch, the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Thank you. He says that he is the vine. We are the branches. His father is the husbandman or vine dresser. The father purges the branches so that they can bear fruit. And if we do not be connected, if we do not stay connected to the vine, we cannot bear fruit. Now interesting, the father purges or prunes the vines. What is the purpose of pruning a vine? or pruning a tree. You grow a branch, what is the purpose of pruning that tree? Huh? So that it be more fruitful. You, you cut off the dead stuff, the stuff that's non-productive, so, that so that it may be allowed to be more productive. Isn't that right? God oftentimes prunes us. He oftentimes sifts us, you know, in order that we may be more fruitful. So whenever God is allowing you to go through some stuff, it could be that he's pruning you so that you can bear more fruit. Jesus said in verse five, apart from me, you can do nothing, right? So it is very important, it is vitally important that we stay connected to the vine. Then, how to access the power of Christ. We spoke last week about walking by faith. In order to access the power of Jesus, you must walk by faith. And I shared with you last week, there are two kinds of faith. There's natural faith, 
and there's Bible faith. And I said natural faith is based upon your five senses, what you can see, hear, taste, touch, and smell. Isn't that right? Skip, if I went to his house and you know, he invited me to dinner and I sat down at his table and he put a plate of food before me and it, it looked okay and it smelled okay and it tasted okay, I would eat it. But if it looked burnt or raw or I saw a roach crawling from under the plate, natural faith tells me there's something wrong with this food, so I wouldn't eat it. But Bible faith, Bible faith is going according to the direction of God's word. Even when you don't see or understand where you're going, you are going, you are moving solely based upon the word of God. Problem is, a lot of us won't move unless we can see where we're going, unless we understand where we're going and how we're going to get there. That's not Bible faith. And the whole 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is dedicated to people who moved according to the word of God without having seen what the future held or where they were going or why they were doing what they were required to do. That's walking by faith, all right? So we must learn to walk by faith. Now that would naturally imply the next thing that we must do in order to access the power of God, we need to feed upon the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. and hearing by word. Without faith it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God must first believe that he is and that is the reward of them who diligently seek him. Isn't that right? Faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. So how can you have faith how can you walk by faith, God's word, if you don't know God's word? And the only way you can know God's word is to study God's word. Isn't that right? So we must, brothers and sisters, be constantly fed a diet of God's word in order to walk by faith. The problem is most of us well, many of us get our diet of God's word when we come here. Sunday morning, some places Sunday evening, and Wednesday night. And the rest of the week, the meal is sitting on the pew or in the car or at the house somewhere. Question, how would your physical body respond if you only fed it twice a week? How many of y'all only eat twice a week, physically? Why not? Why not, Skip? Hey, man, I like to eat. Huh? I, I get weak if I don't eat. Night here. That's interesting. That's interesting, you said. <laughs> you said you get what? Night here, this week. Yeah. Weak. weak. You wonder why so many people's faith is weak? Because they don't eat enough. Because they're spiritually malnourished. So when the devil comes, when the enemy comes, he can, overtake you. he can overtake you because you're too weak. Huh? Too weak to fight. You see? So it's important, brothers and sisters, that we feed upon God's word. Now, with all of the recent deaths that we have heard of and experienced, as I thought about my uncle's passing and I thought about the young man yesterday who was killed, it, it drove home a reality for me, and even all of the, the funerals that we've had here and all of the loved ones that have been lost, you know, our, our family here have experienced, it drove home a reality to me. And that reality is that one day, I too mm -hmm. will leave here. Yes. And it doesn't matter whether I, you know, die of cancer or whether someone kills me or whether I fall asleep one night and never wake up, it doesn't matter how. But the 
fact is, the reality is that one day, I and you, we have to go that way. We will all have to leave here. The question is, what will we leave behind? What have you done with your time on this side? What legacy will you leave when you leave here? What will people remember you by? How many of you remember Dr. Martin Luther King? Mm -hmm. What do you remember about him? How do you remember him? How do you remember Dr. King? A leader. Hmm? Steadfast. Ma'am? He was steadfast. Steadfast in what? In his work. In his work, okay. He was a leader. Hmm? He was passionate. Passionate. About what he believed. About his convictions, right? How do you think he would want to be remembered? And how would you want to be remembered? I'm going to eliminate the guess for you, because I'm going to let you hear from his own mouth how he wanted to be remembered. This is an excerpt from a sermon that I have on Dr. King, the sermon was entitled The Drum Major Instinct. And listen to, in his words, how he wanted to be remembered. About that day when we will be victimized with what is life's final common denominator. That's something that we call death. We all think about it, and every now and then I think about my own death, and I think about my own funeral, and I don't think of it in a morbid sense. Every now and then I ask myself, what is it that I would want said? And I leave the word to you this morning. If any of you are around, when I have to meet my day, I don't want a long funeral. And if you get somebody to deliver the eulogy, tell them not to talk too long. Every now and then I wonder what I want them to say. Tell them not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell them not to mention that I have three or four hundred other awards. That's not important. Tell them not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the wall question. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try to feed the hungry. I want you to be able to say that day that I did try in my life to clothe those who were naked. I want you to say on that day that I did try in my life to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. Yes, if you want to say that I was a drum major, say that I was a drum major for justice. Say that I was a drum major for peace. I was a drum major for righteousness. And all of the other shallow things will not matter. I won't have any money to leave behind. I won't have the fine and luxurious things of life to leave behind. But I just want to leave a committed life behind. And that's all I want to say. If I can help somebody as I pass along, if I can cheer somebody with a well song, if I can show somebody he's traveling wrong, then my living will not be in vain. If I can do my duty as a Christian, or if I can bring salvation to a world once wrought, if I can spread the message as the Master taught, then my living will not be in vain. Yes, Jesus, I want to be on your right or your left side, not for any selfish reason. I want to be on your right or your left side, not in terms of some political kingdom or ambition, but I just want to be there in love and in justice and in truth and in commitment.
to others so that we can make of this old world a new world. From his own mouth, that's how he wanted to be remembered. The question on the floor is, how do you want to be remembered? What will people say about you when you are stretched out here? And you know, one of the saddest things, and I heard of a preacher who preached a eulogy and no one had anything good to say about the person that was there. He said that was the most difficult service he ever had to perform. Normally a person's life and a eulogy by definition is a speech given in praise of someone. You preach your eulogy in your life. And when you leave here, your life speaks for you. And when people come up here and people talk about, you know, this person was a giving person, this person was a caring person, this person took care of me, that is a testament to that person's life. You don't do that after you die, you do that while you're living. And then it speaks for you after you're gone. Question on the floor. And I just want you to think about this. You don't really have to hold your hand up and, and you know, tell us. You can if you would like to. But I want you to think about it. Because all of us, brothers and sisters, one day will go that way. What will your life say about you? How will people remember you? Ultimately, and, and I don't want you to miss the point that I was trying to make. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what we think about you after, you after you're gone. It's what God thinks that matters. But when we are here, the purpose we are here, number one, to glorify God. Number one, right? right. Our purpose is to glorify God. Right. It is to make an impact in the world. Jesus said in Matthew 25, when he was talking about the parable of the sheep and the goats, you know, he said the goats were on the left side because they didn't feed the hungry. They didn't clothe the naked. They didn't visit the sick. They didn't visit those who were in prison. The sheep on the right went into eternal glory because they visited the sick. They took care of those in need. You know, they did things. Their work is what so it doesn't matter what we say, but we are to make an impact in this life. We as Christians especially are salt and light, which means we are to impact this world. So if you go through life as a Christian and you don't impact this world, something is wrong with your testimony. Isn't that right? That's right. We are here to glorify God. We are here to prepare for eternity and we are here to make an impact in the world. Now, there will always be people who don't see everything you do, but God sees everything that you do. God knows your heart. All of us have done things in our lives, in our past, you know, that we don't want to come back up. And there's always someone who was back there who saw you when you did that. Mm -hmm. So as many, you know, uh, good things as people will have to say about you now, there will always be someone who remember you when. But see, what matters is God took back there and he blotted it out with the blood of Christ. So it's no longer there, the guilt of it. So with God, that doesn't matter, you see? But the devil will come in and the devil will try to use that to drive a wedge in people. And I've heard a lot of bad, negative things about Dr. King. I'm not the judge. My point in playing that tape was that these are the things he wanted to be remembered for. He wanted to be remembered for a life of service. He wanted to be, re the, the sermon was about, you know, the text was John, uh, when James and John requested of Jesus to sit one sit on the right hand, one sit on the left, and Jesus said, that's not mine to give. If you want to be great in the kingdom, you'd be a servant. And he was pointing out in the sermon that Everyone can be great because everyone can serve. You don't have to be rich to serve. You don't have to be educated to serve. Anyone can serve. Therefore, anyone can be great in the kingdom. And if you want to think of him as great, 
Don't think of him as great because of his education, his achievements. Think of him as great for being a servant. And that's what we all should strive for. Now, we are not here to please man, per se, but we please God through service to man. The scripture says, 1 John chapter 4, you know, how can a man say, I love God, whom he cannot see, and hate his brother, who he sees daily? Or how can you know, I say I love my brother when I see my brother in need, and I say to him, be warmed and filled, and don't do anything to help him out? Pleasing God means serving him through serving man. You see? That's why Jesus said in that parable, Matthew 25, you want to please me? You serve me. How do you serve me? By serving the least of these, my brethren. When you have an opportunity, when you see a need and have an opportunity and resources, you have a responsibility and an obligation to do something about that. That's how you serve God. That's how you please God. It's not about coming to church every time the doors swing open and singing the loudest, you know, in the, in the devotion. That's, God can get that from rocks. He doesn't need you for that. What he wants us to do is to serve him through serving man and by showing man his love, his love reflecting from us onto our fellow man. Because what that does is it brings him glory it serves our brother, you know, our fellow man, and it draws them to God. That's what he wants. You see? Now, in the series, Keeping It Real, we looked at how the issues of life impact us. We talked about, you know, facing giants, and we talked about, you know, storms and abuse and neglect, all of these things that in the world affects us or impacts us. The question is, what have we learned from this? What have you learned from your experience in this life? Do you not know that my philosophy is life is about living, learning, and sharing. As you go through this life, you learn lessons in this life. Some you learn, and I, I believe you learn through three Medium, you learn by instruction, by example, and some of us learn the hard way, by experience. But either way, you learn a lesson. When you learn lessons in life, I believe you should share those lessons with someone else to help them not have to learn it the way you learned it, you know? So the question is, what have you learned in your walk, in your experience in this life, given all of the information that we've studied so far, the fact that life is brief, life is difficult. We have an enemy, the devil, who seeks to sabotage our journey. But God supplies all of our needs. Jesus is there, ready, willing, and able, you know, to help us. What have you learned? Just keeping it real. Mm -hmm. uh, I encounter some people on the job. You know, I like that verse where uh, Jesus tells them, look at man, if they don't want to accept, if they don't want to accept what you got to offer, knock the dust off your feet, keep, keep on moving. stepping. That, mm -hmm. And uh, I try to do that with people. Mm -hmm. if, they don't want, if they don't want Dave to be real with them and, and, and share the word of God with them and be me in, in my own loving way, uh, you know, I just knock the dust off my feet, keep on stepping. Mm -hmm. Because somebody wants it. You know, everybody won't receive me right, but you right. Know, somebody wants it. So I learned that you can't help everybody. That's actually a very valuable lesson because there are a lot of people who, you know, frustrate themselves yeah. and cause problems within their own relationships or in their own lives yeah. trying to help someone who doesn't want to be helped. Yeah. You can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped, period. Now, these are so, for, for all of you younger folk in here. This is wisdom. This is life experience. There are some things you learn in life by living life. You know, book knowledge don't get you all of this. Book knowledge will get you 
some things in life, but the most valuable lessons you learn in life, you learn from life. The most important, the most valuable lesson that I personally have learned is that I need the Lord. I can't make it down here without him. And I learned that. And I learned it the hard way because I've tried to make it without leaning on him, without relying on him, without trusting in him. I've tried to manipulate some things and, you know, pray to God and ask God to, to do it, but rather than let him do what he does in his timing and in his way, I tried to give him a little help and mess it up. So I have learned, the most valuable lesson that I've learned in this life is to, is that I need the Lord. And that whatever his timing is, it's perfect for the situation, whether or not I see that at the time or not. Case in point, I told you my, my uncle passed away four o'clock this morning. We just had our family reunion in May in New Orleans. I had an aunt who lived in Georgia who a couple of months before the family reunion, she was terminally ill. They weren't expecting her to live. But God allowed her to recover her health enough to come to the family reunion. She had a respirator, she had an oxygen tank, was pulling an oxygen tank and had, you know, a respirator, but she was there. My uncle who just passed away, he coordinated the whole family reunion. He put the whole thing together. Were it not for him, we would not have had the family reunion. God's timing, God allowed him and her to be at that family reunion. And five generations of my family were together. And after the family reunion, she passed away, and then he passed away this morning. But in his timing, he allowed them to be there. You can't question God's timing. I've learned not to question God's timing. You know, it may not always be convenient for me. We always say, you know, God, you, how we say that? He may not come when you, when you want him, but he's always, that's true. It's true. So, as we conclude, as we, as we bring to a conclusion this series, Keeping It Real, we're in the world. Isn't that right? We are not of the world. We are not to behave like the world, but we are in the world. And being in the world, we are exposed to a lot of things. We are exposed to pain and suffering and heartache and disappointment and all of these things that everyone else is exposed to. But our difference is our response to it. That's what makes us different from everyone else. As salt, as light, our response should be such that it glorifies God, that it would cause someone to inquire, how are you handling that like that? Why is it all of these things are happening to you and you handling it like that? That gives you an opportunity to share with them your faith. It glorifies God. Isn't that right? And it helps you to grow. Here's our motivation. The scripture says, whatever you do in word or deed, do it what? In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Or as unto the Lord. So when we are doing things for people, our motivation shouldn't be, you know, what we're going to get back from them. It should be, I'm privileged to be able to serve God through serving this person. You know? That's what our mindset should be. If we looked at it as helping someone who deserves help or who can do something for me in return, anybody can do that. Anybody can do that. When Jesus taught the story, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan, this was, a, this was a man who had been beaten 
and left robbed and beaten and left for dead along the side of the road. Along comes a priest and the Levite who sees him, looks at him, crosses over to the other side and goes on their way and don't help this person. But then a Samaritan comes along. Now understand, the Samaritans and the Jews have nothing to do with each other. Out of the three people who had opportunity to help this man, Jesus is showing us that the person least likely to help that person was the one who did help that person. And he, so he told that story in answer to a question that was asked to him, who is my neighbor? And after he told the story, he asked them a question, now who is your neighbor? And the answer was, whoever's in need. It doesn't matter whether he's one of yours or not. If you have opportunity and resources, you have responsibility. That brings God glory. Anybody can help their own, someone they love or someone they're, you know, someone who can do something. Anyone can do that. But it's the love of God who can help someone who can't help you or who can help someone who, you know, could possibly hurt you. God's got you. So you don't worry about that. You see? Any questions? Six months, y'all, we've been talking about this. I really pray that we all learn. I know I have personally learned a lot from studying for this series. And the things that I've learned in studying for this series have really helped me to grow. I've been preaching for, I'm teaching and preaching for over 30 years, you know, but never get to the point where you think you know it all or you can't grow anymore. As long as we are here, we'll be growing. And when you get to the point where you stop growing, something is wrong. Something is seriously wrong with you. And I have learned, I have grown more in the past six months than I have in years just studying this stuff. So I really hope that it has benefited you as much as it has benefited me.